Okay, so welcome to my today's talk, which is not so closely about IT, but rather about uh, statistics. Uh, yeah, the reason why I decided to uh, have a talk on this topic is that uh, I'm not very happy about uh, the way benchmarks are often used in IT. Uh, where people simply run a benchmark, get some number, and believe this is exactly what they wanted, and uh, do uh, no analysis of uh, what actually the number means and if it has some relevance. So we have a. Uh, so assume we are measuring something like network throughput, uh, latency. Uh, storage throughput or some other value like that. We usually have some program which runs some tests, measures a value, which can be amount of data transferred, uh, the time needed to finish the task, or uh, something else, essentially anything. Uh, the worst thing we can do is just take this number and use it as the value we wanted to measure. Because the, the value coming out of the benchmark is of almost no use. We have some hidden abstraction and some hidden value which we, are, which we want to measure, but uh, we don't get always the same results. So if we run the benchmark multiple times, we usually get different results, sometimes even very different results. And we want to now, we need to know uh, what to do with them. We cannot take one of them because we don't know which of them is the right one. Usually it's none of them. So what can we do is to run the benchmark multiple times, uh, take the average of the values or arithmetic mean and use that instead instead of one value. Uh, that's generally better. Uh, we somehow expect that uh, the more iterations we take, the better the resulting mean value will be. But we still do not have any quantification uh, where, in what interval, or what to expect about the hidden theoretical value that we are trying to measure. So, how far to expect from the mean? Uh, sometimes we can see that uh, in addition to the mean value, uh, the software also produces, or we can calculate it on our own, uh, the standard mean deviation, which is out outcome of some uh, formula, which gives us some idea about how spread the values are from the mean. Uh, yes, there is a question by Ivan Ivanov. Hello? No? No. Okay. So no question, it seems. Uh, but uh, we still don't know what exactly does this mean or what is the probability that... Uh, often people believe that uh, values are to be expected somehow within the distance of the standard deviation from the mean value. Uh, that's true to some extent, but that's true only with some probability, which we don't generally know. So let's take a look at some theory first. Uh, I have to say uh, in advance that uh, most of what I will be saying is not precise and not exact, because it's just a quick summary of a rather complicated theory, which usually takes at least one semester of university to get through. 
Uh, and we definitely do not have that much of time. So uh, let's just uh, look at it with a lot of simplification, but uh, enough to see what is going on. So we have some abstraction, which is called random variable. The definition says uh, that it's a variable whose values depend on outcomes of a random phenomenon, which, um, to be honest, um, doesn't say much. Uh, what can be imagined is that a random variable for us is kind of random number generator, which issues numbers where, whenever we want to take sample with some random distribution. Or for the, uh, for the purpose of benchmarking, it can be also used to represent the hidden actual value, which we are trying to measure. So what comes out from the random variable are the measured values. And each of uh, each random variable has a distribution, which tells us how the values are distributed with what probability they are distributed. This can be described by uh, so-called cumulative distribution function. Uh, okay, one one simple note uh, for the simplicity and because we do not really need anything else here, uh, we will always expect the random variables that uh, produce real numbers as values. Uh, the probability and statistic theory is more complicated and more general, but uh, we will use this simple uh, basic case, which covers essentially whatever we need for our purpose. So cumulative distribution function is a function which for any value tells us the probability that the sample or the random variable is less than or equal to this value. So, uh, for, so the uh, value of this function zero is the probability that the value is non-negative. Uh, naturally, this function is always between zero and one. It's uh, non-decreasing and its uh, limits at minus infinity is zero, limit at minus plus infinity is one. So it grows from zero to one. Uh, we will see some example in a moment, some examples in a moment. Another function that can be used and that is more often used to describe the uh, distribution of a random variable is the probability density function, which uh, tells us for any argument, uh, essentially the probability that the random values are from neighborhood of this argument. So one way to describe it is that we take uh, an, a small interval around that argument, uh, look at the probability that the value is in this interval and divide it by the width of the, uh, the interval. Uh, for nice distributions and good, good behaving distributions, they would be the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. Again, in a moment, we will see some examples where it will be more obvious what this means. And then we have two well, there are more, but two in the most interesting uh, quantitative parameters of a distribution. One would be one would be the mean value. Mean value is the kind of the expected average of values produced by the random variable or the generator, and then variance or standard mean deviation, which uh, tells us how spread are the values around the mean. Ah, in the slide, you can see some formulas how to calculate it. So let's take a look at some examples. I'll use three basic, very similar, uh, simple examples. So first would be a uniform distribution. Uniform distribution or is a distribution where the values are distributed evenly uh, on a certain interval. In this case, in the uh, in the pictures, it's interval from zero to one, and values are distributed randomly. We can see that the uh, density function on the top uh, picture is uh, 
equal to one in this interval, in this case, of course, uh, where the width is one, zero elsewhere. So the distribution is really even within the, the interval. The cumulative function starts at zero, then it grows linearly between zero and one, and it's one anywhere right of one. Uh, as you can see, because of the relation between cumulative distribution function and probability density function, uh, the area below the probability density, the density function is always one. And, or if you want, the integral from minus, infinity, uh, minus infinity to plus infinity is always one. Okay, uh, we have also some formulas how to calculate or what is the mean value and the standard mean deviation, deviation of this uniform distribution. So that's probably the simplest distribution one can think of. Uh, it's not the most important and most usual one that's a bit more complicated, so-called normal distribution. As the name suggests, it's uh, uh, considered the very basic or normal standard distribution. It's uh, what people usually call Gaussian curve or bell curve. And the important why, uh, the reason why it is so important and why we are so interested in it is that actually most uh, random values coming from nature, uh, either as a result of some chemical, physical uh, experiment or most measurements, actually have normal distribution. Uh, this is not a coincidence. It's actually something that has very good mathematical reason. And we will get to that reason later in this talk. So what is uh, so what can we say? Uh, the density can be expressed by a relatively simple function. It doesn't look as simple here. I have to admit, but uh, if you forget about the constant, it's, it's constants that are used to shift and scale the curve, uh, it's a relatively simple function. Uh, the normal distribution has two parameters, its mean value and its standard mean deviation. And uh, the normal distribution with uh, mean mu and uh, standard mean deviation sigma is usually called n mu sigma square. Well, sigma square because that's the variance and uh, some formulas look better if you think about the variance rather of the standard mean deviation. Okay, and uh, the basic canonical standard uh, distribution, normal distribution is n01, which means, which is what we have in these pictures. So it's a distribution with a mean value of zero. As the density function is symmetric, it's obvious that the mean value is in the middle. It's not always the case, of course. And uh, this is what does the cumulative distribution function look like. It's uh, essentially it's rescaled what is sometimes called the error function. It grows nicely smoothly from zero to one. So this is for the, for the density and cumulative function of normal distribution looks like. Okay. Well, then, uh, and as a third example, is something I would call coin distributions. There are some official names, some uh, more scientific names, but uh, those do not seem to be unified. So I will just simply say coin distribution. It's a random value which produces values of zero and one with each with probability of one half. So it's essentially a model of tossing a coin. Uh, well, this distribution does not really have a density function because what we need, what we have here is uh, what is sometimes called the Dirac distributions. 
Physicists often call it Dirac function, but it's not really a function. So it's kind of a representation of a point mass, half in zero, half in one. Uh, the cumulative distribution function is not continuous. It's a step function, which is zero up to zero, then one half between zero and one, and one for the rest, the real x. So that's uh, an example of distribution, which is not really nice, but as we will see later, it still behaves surprisingly well from some point of view. So, uh, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, the mean value of a random variable of a generator uh, can be seen or can be understood as a expected average of multiple samples from the distribution. So, if we have uh, some, maybe have some generator, uh, some random variable with specific distribution, and now, take multiple samples, n samples, let's say, uh, and uh, calculate the arithmetic mean of those samples, of those n samples, which means some of them divided by the, the, their number. Uh, what does the uh, what we expect is that. Uh, for small number of samples or small number of experiments or measurements, uh, the, the average can vary quite a lot and may not be, uh, not, it's not necessarily close enough to the mean value, the hidden mean value of the uh, distribution. Uh, however, if we take enough samples, if we repeat the experiment enough times, the values will, will actually get closer and for sufficiently large number, we will be sufficiently close to the mean value. Uh, this is essentially what the law of large numbers says, which means that uh, the mean value is actually what, it, what we expect it to express. Uh, the Exact formulation is, of course, a bit, complicated, a bit more complicated because we have some assumptions, as mathematical theorems usually do. And uh, it's also complicated to, or more complicated to explicitly state what actually close means. So uh, to get some idea. There are two kinds of um, uh, laws of large numbers. This uh, weak law of, law of large numbers, which says that when I, whenever I take a small interval around the arbitrarily small interval around the mean value, the probability that the average will, after n, uh, samples will fall into the interval, will converge to one. Then there is a strong number which gives a stronger statement, uh, but that would require some uh, theoretical background. So, well, let's stay with the people's understanding of what law of large numbers means. Uh, Okay, uh, the next interesting st uh, theorems or results of probability and statistics are so-called central limit theorems. There is more than one, again, uh, uh, similar to law of large numbers. There are multiple theorems which differ in assumptions and differ in the definition of what close exactly means. The idea is that if we have random uh, random variables with certain mean uh, common mean value and standard deviation, and take their sum, sum of uh, independent random variables with this mean value and deviation, then the sum can be approximated by normal distribution with uh, uh, 
mean value, which is essentially n times mu. That's what we kind of expect. If we sum, uh, if we sum n values with a mean of mu, then the sum should be somewhere uh, should have mean value of n mu. And more interesting, uh, the variance is n times sigma square, where sigma square was the original variance. This is uh, interesting because uh, it's not n square as one would uh, one would expect, and that will show to be very important. So it does the variance does not grow as fast as we would expect it. Uh, there is one thing that is even more important, uh, so I would like to uh, stress it out, and that is that whatever the original distribution was, for a sufficient number of samples, the sum will have distribution which will be close to normal distribution. So even, even if we start with something else, and for some of the theorems, we can have even different distributions for each sample, only with common parameters, then uh, the result will be close to normal distribution. We will see that in a moment, uh, examples of that in a moment. Uh, for our purpose of benchmarking and interpretation of benchmarks, uh, we are more interested usually uh, in the average. Uh, I'm sorry, this should be. There should be plus here. So we are more interested in the average of these values, not their sum. And a simple calculation shows us that uh, this, uh, the average, uh, will have again normal distribution with the mean value of mu. That's not surprising. That's, that's a that's a consequence of the law of large numbers. And the distribution will be, uh, sorry, the variance will be sigma square over n. That means that the standard deviation, standard mean deviation would be sigma over square of uh, square root of n. Uh, the, the important part of this is that it gives us some quantification about how close can we expect uh, these averages to be to the mean value? So this is the quanti this is a quantification of uh, uh, the uh, natural expectation that uh, the more samples we take, the uh, lower the uh, deviation or the dispersion around the mean value is going to be. And again, uh, once more, I would like to stress out that uh, even if we start with a different distribution, we end up with uh, something that is close to or looks like very similar to uh, normal distribution. So let's take a, a look at some examples. Let's go back to the three examples of distribution we had in the beginning. So, okay, this uh, simple example is normal distribution. Uh, for the normal distribution, uh, we can see that uh, we start with what we have seen in the picture a few minutes ago. This is the, this is the N01, the canonical normal distribution uh, here. Uh, denoted as average of one. We take average of one normal distribution, which is the normal distribution, of course. Uh, if we take the average of two values, of two independent values, uh, the distribution will be slightly different. It's again normal distribution uh, centered at zero, unsurprisingly, but the standard mean deviation is lower. It will be something like one over square over uh, square of two. 
uh, which means that the uh, the curve will shrink a bit horizontally and will be a bit higher to compensate that because the area still has to be uh, exactly one under the curve. If we take average of four samples, we get we shrink even more and have higher densities in the middle. And this is average of eight variables. Uh, because we took uh, we, because we took um, the same normal distributions and uh, took average of samples of from the same normal distribution, the result is again a normal distribution, and unsurprisingly, it's exactly the same distribution as the central limit theorem would uh, estimate. So in this case, even if uh, there is something the CLT estimate uh, shown in a red, we actually do not see any red curve here because um, it's exactly the same as the blue one and I wanted it to hide behind. So what is it, what will the result look like for something more complicated? So let's take a look at the uniform distribution. So this is again the uniform distribution between on the interval 0, 1. Uh, the density is even, it's 1 on 0, 1. Average of 2 is already a partially uh, partwise linear function, looking like a tent. Average of 3 already starts to look a little bit like normal distribution, like the good old Gaussian curves. And it looks even more so for average of four. Uh, let's take a look at how good the approximation actually is. And uh, not very good for one and equal to one. That's expected. However, for n equal to two, the approximation is already surprisingly close. And when we take a look at three, yeah, unlike the previous picture, this, these are averages of uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, so for three, we are already very close, except for the middle. And uh, already for four samples, the results are quite impressive. At least I think they are quite impressive. And... How about the coin distribution, which is not even uh, does not even have a density continuous? So uh, this is one toss of a coin, zero and one with probability of one half. With two tosses, we have uh, one half for zero and one, uh, one quarter for. Uh, ah, yeah. These pictures are actually. Uh, normalized in the y-axis so uh, the values on the i-axis are not uh, exactly the probabilities uh, these values are normalized in order to be able to compare to the estimate given by central limit theorem but we can see that uh, the distribution here which is given by the binomial coefficient as you probably know coefficients starts to look a bit like going around the standard Gaussian curves. So let's look at what does it really look like. And again, for it's not as fast as for uniform distribution, but for, for eight samples, we are already very, very close. And with a growing number of samples, we would be, uh, we would be even closer and uh, the uh, fill with these points, the fill of the curve will get denser. So we can see that even for something as wild as the coin distribution, the central limit theorem uh, gives us pretty good estimate, pretty nice estimate of what to expect if we, we take multiple samples. So what does this mean? If we toss a coin one or two times, we can expect very varying results. But if we toss a coin, for example, 20 times or 
you can see that you, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, then we can expect the number of zeros and ones to be about one half, very close to one half. So one thing is that the resulting distribution is close to normal. The other thing is that uh, the more samples we uh, take, uh, the closer we can expect the uh, lower the variance is going to be, which is nice. So this uh, justifies our expectation that uh, taking multiple measurements, taking many, many, uh, more measurements and taking their average uh, will get us close or closer to the expected value. So, uh, uh, let's get back to the, to our uh, distributions and let's take a look at what exactly does that uh, standard mean the uh, standard mean deviation tell us about the distribution so yeah uh, these are the three distributions we had here so for the this is the normal canonical normal distribution n01 uh, which uh, has by definition standard mean deviation of one. So the interval from mu minus uh, sigma to mu plus sigma is from minus one to one. And as we can see, uh, most or more than half of the values are actually within this interval. Uh, Right now, I don't remember the exact number, but it's not much more than one half. So the performance approximation that uh, the values are expected to be somewhere within sigma distance of mu is not really justified. It's about slightly more than one half of them. I don't remember. I don't want to say the probability because I don't remember it, to be honest, but it can be found. Uh, okay, so for uniform distribution, uh, the mean standard mean deviation was, I think, uh, 1 over square root of 12, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it's like, it looks like this. So. This would be the area where we expect to be to be within the uh, uh, within the uh, standard mean deviation from the mean value, uh, and again, it's a bit more than one half, but not much more than one half. So, if uh, what does it mean? Does it, it does mean that? Uh, if you go the other way, because in real life, uh, we don't know the parameters of the hidden distribution. We don't know the actual value. Uh, there, uh, there often is no actual value. But the mean value we uh, expect to have is kind of calculated, uh, uh, is calculated uh, uh, so we what we have are the samples, the measurements, and we approximate the mean value by the average of the measurements, and then want to know with what probability the uh, actual value, the mean value, is uh, within some interval around the average of the measurements. Uh, so if we just take sigma, I'll uh, we don't have much of a probability. We are not very sure about that. So, uh, and for coin distribution, the uh, standard mean distribution is one, which is kind of to be expected because all possible values are exact, uh, sorry, not one, one half, uh, which is not surprising as all possible values are exactly one half from the middle. So 
the mean standard mean deviation is one half. So we get exactly to those values, but it doesn't really tell much. Okay, so what? Uh, so we would be interested in so-called. Uh, this can be generalized to so-called critical values. So a critical value uh, here for the normal distribution uh, tells us for which width of the interval centered at the mean, the probability that the value is with this, within this distance is uh, from the mean value is alpha. So we have, we have a mean value. We have a mean value, in this case, zero. And we want to find, find an interval centered at the mean value so that uh, the calculated values, calculated values, uh, the calculated values, uh, sorry, uh, so that the samples will be within this interval with given probability. This probability is uh, often called level of confidence. It's usually denoted by alpha. And typically, it's some number close to 1. Uh, the most, two most common values used are 0 0.95 and 0 0.99, which means we are looking at interval centered and uh, the mean value, where 95 or 99% of uh, the random samples is going to be. And uh, Due to the symmetry, it also says the opposite. If we take a sample, then the mean value, the hidden mean value, is within this width, this critical value, critical width, from uh, our measurement. Uh, this is for symmetric tests. Uh, usually, this is used for symmetric tests where we want to, uh, where, where we do not prefer any side. Sometimes we are doing so called, uh, sometimes we are doing so called one sided tests. Then we take a, a slightly bit different approach uh, where we want to now a value where everything will be on one side or almost everything, which means probability of alpha, is on one side of that value, usually on the left. So for example, for, uh, in this case, we would be looking at some value where we would now that uh, with probability of 95 or 99%, uh, the samples will be less than or less than or equal than this value. OK, so that's one-sided critical value. value. Uh, here we are going to, uh, things are going to be a bit complicated, because uh, to calculate the critical value, uh, we actually need uh, to take inverse of the cumulative distribution function. And as the cumulative distribution function itself is rather complicated and cannot be expressed by a simple formula, uh, it's even worse for its inverse. So we uh, have two options, either used existing tables. For example, there is a Wikipedia page uh, where the values are, critical values are tabulated for most uh, common and most interesting distributions, including normal distribution, or use some numerical software which has libraries with uh, numerical approximate calculation of these critical values. And that's also reason that uh, why the usual numbers of alpha are fixed, because uh, we don't want to have too many or too complicated two-dimensional tables. So as I said, uh, most common values are 95 and 99. 
Okay. So, yeah, so let's critical values. Now, what is a confidence interval? And I'm afraid um, so, so I will have to end by, uh, with, at the confidence interval and we probably not get to practical examples. So, yeah, uh, the problem, uh, so the, the confidence interval is essentially the interval between the uh, critical values, but there is a slight problem. If we, even if we expect the hidden random variable to have normal distribution and therefore the samples, uh, so so we, if we knew these uh, these parameters, we could use a auxiliary uh, distribution calculated by uh, subtracting the mean and dividing by the uh, standard deviation. This would have a canonical zero uh, normal distribution and zero one. And we could use the critical values to determine the interval where the hidden value lies with given probability. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case in real life, because if we are measuring something, we don't know the parameters. We are actually trying to estimate the parameters. So what we have to take are the estimates of these parameters. Uh, so the natural estimate for the mean value is the average of the measured values. And uh, not so natural, uh, the not so natural estimate of the standard mean deviation is the standard deviation. Uh, there are two uh, formulas for the standard deviation, and it's very confusing, and it looks very unnatural, because one would actually expect here n rather than n minus 1, so that it would be actually the square mean of the differences between uh, value n and average. Uh, for technical reasons, which can be either calculated or explained uh, in people's language, uh, we actually want and should use this as n minus one, which uses n minus one. Uh, simply speaking, the reason is that we are, uh, is exactly the fact that we are using average of our uh, measured values rather than the actual mean value. So we are cheating a tiny bit because because the, of the fact that we are using our own average we get a bit closer uh, to the uh, to the average than we would be from the mean value uh, so this n minus one rather than n is sometimes called uh, i think bernoulli compensation or something like that uh, and i will just close this very fast so the resulting random value has so-called student distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom, whatever that means. And again, it's critical values which are uh, denoted or uh, as t n minus one alpha, or uh, sometimes the n minus one, the number of degrees of freedom, is given as first argument in the parentheses. These are again tab tabulated or approximately calculated in software. So, uh, okay, we don't have the time for showing this in video. So if anyone is interesting, I can, uh, I can uh, show it to them. Uh, but uh, if you look at the very uh, well-known and often used uh, software NetPerf, then it does have two parameters, dash capital I and dash lowercase i. One of them uh, allows you to specify a confidence level, which is this alpha. And the other is the width, or I think, I'm not sure now if it's width of, or half width of the confidence interval in percent. And 
when you use these parameters, which are not used by default, by default, uh, we simply take a given number of iterations or one iteration, and we just get the average. If we use these parameters, NetPerf iterates the test so many times, uh, iterates until the confidence interval width relative to the mean value is on given uh, confidence level is within uh, the width you specified. So you can, for example, tell NetPerf, continue iterating until the probability that the mean value is within, say, 5%, or it's not really 5%. If you use 5, it will be 2.5 to each side. Uh, within 2.5% of the mean value is at least 95 or 99%. And that's much more valuable results because once we have that, unless uh, NetPerf gives up after a certain number of iterations, uh, we can really say, okay, well, the uh, mean value is with 95%, 99% confidence in this specific interval. And that's also a simple, a simple way to check if we can expect or cannot expect the regression. Because if we take confidence intervals for the old and new measurement, uh, we can calculate the probability that there is a uh, uh, regression uh, from the fact whether they overlap or not. Uh, this is uh, not very reliable and not very good way to do it. There is much better th uh, way, but that would require more time to explain. And uh, I will probably try to write an article put somewhere on uh, our wiki or uh, Confluence uh, to explain these things because I think it can be useful for reference in the future. Okay, I'm sorry that I, I'm already late, but uh, I will be available in the uh, open discussions room if someone is interested in some details or wants to ask something. So thank you for patience and sorry for not really fitting in the time. Thank you, Michal, for the presentation. I will now stop the recording. We don't have uh, time for a question, unfortunately.